This is the Horse Radio Network. What a beautiful day for horses in the morning. You are listening to the number one horse podcast in the world. Here's your entertaining look at the horse world and the people in it. Morning. I'm Mary Kitzmiller from Kemp, Texas. And this is Coach Jen from Ocala, Florida, and you're listening to Horses in the Morning on the Horse Radio Network for May 14th, 2020, episode 2334, brought to you today by Horseware. Good morning, Horse World. What is your favorite day of the week? You never stop learning, you never stop understanding. It's more in depth than just riding a horse knowing that for the rest of my life I could work on this and, and I'll never stop learning. Good morning, Mary. How are you? Um, I'm okay. Pit frazzled, pit frazzled. It's been a crazy <laughs> <Bit> morning. <frazzled. laughs> Today, today's show began with how can we just make this doggone thing happen because technology a little challenging this morning yeah you gotta love uh country internet and of course uh with everyone staying home it's uh clogging an already overtaxed system so i would get five minutes of internet and then it would drop off and uh yeah it's been crazy yes so we have mary on her phone which is why she sounds like she's coming out of a 1939 movie (laughs) <laughs> yeah totally <laughs> because the telephone lines and the telephone system that she's using is probably from 1942 so there we go <laughs> yeah yeah it's a rotary phone yes. i'm right next to the wall <laughs> <laughs> but we're thrilled that you're here because mary stops by the second thursday of every month and mary and i get to sit down and gab and geek out on everything horse training and we have a great time each and every time and what we do is Mary puts a little post over on the HRN Auditor's Facebook page, and it says, who's got questions? And everybody does that. And we sit here, and uh, we come up with things to say about those questions. I'm not going to say we answer them, because sometimes we don't. (laughs) Yeah, they're always really good and intricate questions. They they make me work my brain. (laughs) They make you work your brain. And here on the 14th of May in the year 2020, a vast majority of the country... And for that matter, a good part of the world is on lockdown. And if you don't understand why, because you're listening to this show on May 14th, 2026, just Google 2020 and it'll come up. But anyhow, uh, one of the things that a lot of people are doing right now to help keep themselves sane is taking up new hobbies like Tai Chi and yoga and maybe doing a Peloton and things like that. Have you been taking on anything like that to help keep yourself sane? Yeah, so I've been doing yoga, pick it up, putting it down and on and off for the last few years, and uh, I know some of the auditors are really into a YouTube channel. Uh, it's amazing, called Yoga with Adrienne, and she's really cool yoga instructor out of Austin, Texas, and uh, there's tons of free content. So if you're going nuts and uh, you need something to something to do, I recommend that channel. Lots of really good, excellent free content. Um, I really enjoy it. And I've been um, doing a 30-day um, program. So every so, like at the start of the year, she does like a 30-day. I, I guess it would be kind of a challenge where, you know, it starts pretty simple and it gets more intricate as you go. And um, the reason why uh, this made me think of horse training is I, I did – um, I hadn't done yoga probably since last year, and so I did this whole 30-day thing. I'm feeling pretty proud of myself. My balance is coming back, getting stronger, and, you know, uh, feeling like I'm, I've got a pretty good, good handle on this. But then on the last day, the day 30 of the, the whole 30-day yo- challenge yoga thing, um, she does something that I always forget about and always drives me crazy. She stops with voice prompts and just 
she's like, just do what feels good and, you know, don't worry. You can look at me for guidance. Well, if you're like a downward-facing dog, it's really hard to (laughs) turn your neck over backwards to see what's going on. And the whole idea of it is supposed to be, like, freeing and liberal and you're just, you know, she's got you. She goes, you've got the tools to just do whatever you want. And I cannot relax. I hate it. I have too much anxiety because I have to follow the rules, and I don't want to look up at the screen, and she's doing something else, and I'm doing the wrong thing. And the whole idea is there is no wrong answer. Just do what you want. And um, it made me realize that uh, for someone who is an expert um, in something, in a certain discipline like yoga, it's very easy to say that, like, you know, oh, yeah, you've learned the basic steps, so just put them together and just use your own interpretation. But for someone like me who is, you know, probably, I still consider myself a beginner, um, I, I can't do that. I don't, I don't have enough tools. Even though I've been doing it every day, every morning religiously for 30 days, and then, you know, I've done it for lots of times before that, um, I I did not have the confidence to just go, well, I think I'll do this pose here and I'll throw in this here. I can't do that. I have to have someone telling me every step of the way what to do. Ah, and, let, me, let me jump in right there. Yeah. You've got, and I've, I see this again and again, hold your thought because you're gonna, I'm going to let you jump back in. You're on that plateau where the next, you're on conscious competence. You know Ooh. what you know. You have to, but you have to think about it. You know how to do the movements, but you have to consciously, in the conscious part of your brain, think about what comes next. Thus, the the prompt, auditory prompt. You, but you're not quite ready emotionally to jump to unconscious incompetence. In that, you just have to let it go, and it'll happen. And that's a very difficult step regardless of whether it's yoga, horseback riding, tennis, or driving a car. It's a very difficult step to make because you're using a different part of your brain. Go. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And, and it, it just it made me feel a whole new level of empathy for people that I've taught or I've given advice to because for me, where I'm an expert, or I'd like to consider myself an expert, or I have a lot of experience training horses and so I have this really complex toolbox and I've practiced and I've had everything go wrong and I've had everything go right and I've had that process repeat itself over decades and so when I'm working with a horse I can look at the horse and say you know I was going to do this with you today but I think you know looking at your facial expression right now we're going to jump into this and I would like people when they're working with horses to be able to do that you do not have to follow this cookie cutter step one, step two, step three, step four, or at least that's what I think, you know, just, you know, open it up to interpretation, read your horse, look what he's telling you, da, 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 da. Um, But, you know, now being on the beginner side of a new discipline that I'm trying, I understand how, yes, I, I know that you've given me a bunch of tools and I've practiced them, you know, a lot every day for a month, which is, you know, several times. And I know I should be able to just, you know, flow into this whole great yoga thing, and I cannot do it. And I see the same thing happen with people and their horses. One is you have this extreme fear of making a mistake, and, and the stakes are much higher with horses because you're dealing with an emotional, another emotional being um, who's in your care. So you really don't want to make a mistake. You don't want to mess him up or hurt his feelings or do something bad, and um, so it's I, I, it, it's just this really, um, uh, like I said, I've just had an, another um, appreciation for being at that level where, you know, you might have even worked with horses for years, but it takes, it takes hundreds of horses and hundreds and thousands of hours to get to where you can just look at a horse and say, ah, I think you need to do this. Um, yeah. So, yeah. yeah, I get it. Yeah. <laughs> where the advice part comes in is, um, you know, and I know this this sounds harder, uh, or it's easier said than done, is you need to be, you need to learn at some point to branch out just a little bit, and it's okay to make a mistake. Your horse will forgive you. Um, 
it, you know, it's okay to make a mistake. It's okay to start over again and again and again. Um, but, you know, once you arm yourself with a lot of knowledge, uh, whether it's reading books, going to clinics, taking lessons, um, you, you know, you need to start to realize that you've got a toolbox and it's okay to try different things and it's totally okay to not have them work. And that's where you learn. It, where the learning comes in is trying something, realizing this does, this doesn't work, and then adjusting your plans accordingly. Uh, so, so yeah, that was my little little okay. tidbit so, of insight. So now you've got my little gears going. Yeah. So some of the things that I try to keep in mind whenever I am trying to help somebody with something is here's what we want to do. Um, here's what we don't want to do. And if this happens, we need to go back a step. I have those three criteria when I'm, whenever I have, I'm setting up a plan. Just had to get that out because if I didn't say it right away, it was going to come out of my, leave my brain. So <laughs> that being said, we have um, Frederica who has a couple of horses and she has one that she's trying to teach some new skills to that are also new to her. And the skill is going to be, she's trying to teach her horse to um, move off into an extended trot. She doesn't show necessarily. She just wants to teach her horse that when I say so, we go from just ah, trot to trot and then come back again. So Mary Kitzmiller, she has a horse that's, well broke. She's seven years old, been riding her for years. But whenever she goes out and rides, when she goes from walk to trot to canter or lope, the horse kind of has a one-speed trot. And she wants mm -hmm. to be able to trot faster. What are some things she can do to teach that horse to go at a trot faster? So what I would say is, first, have in your mind what the end result is. You know, know what you're what you're asking for. What what does that trot feel like? What does it look like? Um, so if you have that in your mind, it makes it easier to get there. And then the second thing is, you you do not have to get to that beautiful extended trot, the end result of what you're trying to achieve, in one step. So a lot of when when it comes to extending gates, this is this is a big issue for a lot of horses, even hot horses. Because a lot of times a hot horse wants to go from plotty little walk to gallop. Yes. And they cannot find that <laughs> beautiful lower gear of extended trot. And then with your, you know, of course, with your little more lazy horses that don't like to burn the calories, that's a monumental effort for them. So, you know, it's difficult to get them to that beautiful, energetic, swingy, extended trot. So, again, I'd have your end result in mind. What do you want that trot to look like? And that will help you identify it when it happens. And then the next thing is don't try to get it in one step. So a lot of horses that cannot extend a trot or have difficulty getting there usually have that problem in the walk or even going from the standstill to the walk. I, I will see that issue all the way across the board in the lower gates before that extended trot. So you need to be able to, you know, ask yourself, um, if I ask my horse to go off into a walk from a halt, how's that look? If that's not good, extended trot's way off. That's not going to be good either. So work on standstill to walk. He needs to be able to respond to your cues, you know, as soon as you ask. He, I want lots of energy and enthusiasm. That doesn't necessarily mean speed. He doesn't have to gallop out of his tracks, but I want to feel him bring up his energy and walk with minimal effort from me. And, and then, you know, take that all uh, on up your gears. So he's walking. What's that walk look like? Is it a nice, free-flowing, um, loose rein walk, or is it really choppy? Is he walking two steps trying to stop again? Are you having to keep your leg on him all the time? Are you having to squeeze him in that walk constantly? Um, if you take your legs off, if he, does he just completely quit on you? And um, in a lot of cases, a horse that you're having difficulty extending uh, the gates like the trot or getting them to canter, they'll have this issue. I can see it in the walk, too, but we, we tend to skip over the walk. It's not the fun one. Uh, we just want to go into the, 
the, the big the big movements. So, you know, once he's walking, see if you can get him to extend that walk and see if you can get that walk. I, a challenge that I like for all horses, especially young horses, and this covers so many bases if you work on this, see how much you can stretch that walk out. How big can you get him walking before he physically has to pop into a trot? So for your hot horses, a lot of them, instead of stretching those legs out and reaching out over that top line and really swinging through that walk, they'll just plop into a trot. And so when that happens, no, I need you in the walk because you didn't extend the walk. You just burst it forward into a trot. So you've got to work on it from that end. And then, of course, your lazy horses, um, they want to do the least amount of energy possible. So what you want to do is just ask for a little try. Once you get to an extended walk, let them go back down to their natural walk and then ask them to extend again. This is the key to extending the gait um, is when we think extended trot, we want to be able to do that big old extended trot for 20 minutes around the arena. Well, if you have a horse that's out of shape or he's cantankerous about trying to you know, give you more energy, Asking for 20 minutes is huge. So all I want to do with a horse like that is just get him there. If I'm trotting along and I ask for extension and all of a sudden I feel that energy rush up and he gives me a ton of effort, instead of continuing to ask, I will let him break down all the way to a stop and let him rest for a moment, pet on him, tell him he's a good boy. So he knows that, man, if you just make a little effort, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reward you so much. And then you can build their stamina from there. Like, okay, we got one beautiful extended trot stride several times in a row, and that's doing good. Let's get two, and then three, and then four. And then pretty soon you are able to go all around the arena doing that really big energetic gait. So the bare bones of that is know what the end result looks like, have it in your head, visualize that, what's it feel like, what's it look like, and then realize that it's going to take more than one step to get there. If you're having difficulty, break it down. If you're still having difficulty, break it down more. You can break things down into tiny little micro slivers of behavior, and this is something I learned from the clicker trainers. They're genius uh, at this. If you, know, if you can't get trot, Go for energetic walk. If you can't get walk, go for, okay, bring your energy up from a halt and take one step forward and reward that. And it seems tedious and like you'll never get there, but if you reward every little try along the way, that horse will learn to try harder and harder and harder for you because he knows that you're recognizing his effort and you're going to give him a reward that he's earned. Okay, so great stuff. And since today's theme, and we didn't think of this ahead of time, but I latched onto it, so ha, ha, ha. We we're make, talking about branching out, trying things, and don't be afraid to make a mistake. So I've made a mistake. I get my horse to move forward, but I feel like I have to nag him all the time. My legs are exhausted. I have to carry a crop. I click continuously to keep him going. What have I done wrong? Where were my mistakes first? And then the second part is how can we help to repair those? So what did I do wrong that took a horse who was reluctant to move forward in a given gait to, okay, I will do it, but I will only do it if I'm nagged at? What did I do wrong? Um, Not necessarily something like one mistake that you made. It's just something that happens in the relationship where the horse becomes completely dependent on your cues so much so that any lack of cue means complete lack of anything. Ha! Wait, and, stop right there. Maybe that's what yes. Mary has in the yoga class. Go ahead. Oh. Um, so, uh, <laughs> you know, it just it kind of just happens over time. And I find it happening to me with my horses. And I have to think, oh, you know what? I'm really using a lot of leg on you. And I shouldn't be using this much. And you're getting kind of dull to it. So I have to kind of go and revamp things. So, you know, don't think of it as, oh, I made this huge mistake and I, I did bad. You know, just think of it as, oh, okay, we need to retool things. Let's fix this real quick. And that's what you're going to do your horse's entire life. There will never be a day where he's like, I'm broke. Give me my certificate. I will never come untrained ever. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's a relationship. You've got to work on it. Um, so, yeah, this is, this is very, very common, and I think the, the, the common joke amongst the dressage and the English 
uh, is your trainer's always yelling at you, more leg, more leg. With me, I'm like, get your leg out of that horse. Quit digging into his sides with your heels. Quit touching him with your spurs. And everyone I tell this to is like, I didn't know I was doing that. And I'm like, you are. You totally are. Stop it. (laughs) And it becomes subconscious to where you're so afraid to have a mistake happen and have the horse not respond to your cue that you just hold that heel or that spur into his side even though you don't realize it's happening, and I do this too, to where your horse is completely dependent on constantly being touched with that spur in his side. So if, you, if I all of a sudden look at your heel and say, put your heel down um, and get that spur off of him, the horse stops. And, and people are like, oh, my God, he stopped. So they put their spur right back in. No, 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 don't, don't try to hold him up. He's a 1,000-pound animal. He can hold up himself. So how do you undo that? So my thing is I give the cue. And when the horse is going at the acceptable speed that I asked for, so I'll do whatever it takes to get him, like if I want energetic walk, I might have to kind of flap my legs on his side, maybe apply a little spur. I don't really use spurs for forward, but that's a whole other topic. Um, You might, I know Monty Roberts has the, I think it's a soft cotton rope tool, I I forgot what it's called, that he uses to uh, create some impulsion from behind. That's a really great way to do it. Do whatever you have to do to get the result you're asking for. So in this case, we're asking for energetic walk. As soon as he gets there, relax your aids. You don't want to quit riding completely because in my program, if I completely stop riding, the horse should stop moving. But you don't want to keep that heel, that leg, you know, squeezed on him with that same intensity. As soon as he gets there, relax. And what that is going to do is that's going to tell the horse, you made it. This is what I was asking for. Here's a nice release of pressure. What the horse will most often do, and this is true in green horses or horses that have gotten a little dull to the leg, is once you relax those aids, they putter out on you. Let that happen. Completely say, oh, you made that choice. Well, that's interesting. You don't punish them for it. You don't, like, you know, welt their hiney because they did bad. You let, them, you let them make the mistake. This is where the learning happens. So you relax your aids once you got to that energetic walk, and he completely putters out. So what do you do? Do it all again. So do whatever it takes to get him to that energetic walk. Once he gets there, relax your aids. Okay, and i got a quick question for you. And he's going to do this dozens of times. Yeah. Expect it. It's okay. Yeah, i got a question for you. Yes. This is where timing is important. I give my horses aids. We successfully achieve the energetic walk that I'm looking for. Yay, us. I'm releasing the aids. Do I let him putter back down into a putt-putt walk for half the arena, 15 seconds, three trips around? Because I think, like you, and I think what prompted this question is, this is where the learning happens on the horse's part. Because if we don't time it right, Is he saying it's okay to slow down and now you've asked me to walk again versus, oh, I should not have made that decision, that a better decision was to keep going. So talk a little bit about the timing of relax that aid because we've achieved the walk we want, allow him to make the decision to slow down if he wants to, and then reapply. What kind of a timing are we looking at? I would say think of it in moments. So... You know, when you get them to that beautiful walk and you relax your aids and you feel the walk start to lose quality, don't catch him right away. The idea is don't hold him in it. Let him figure, you know, give him a moment to go back to his lazy walk. And as soon as he gets there, like, okay, this is definitely not my extended walk. So it's just a moment or two, a few strides. um, And then ask again and you're asking when you ask it's it's unemotional you're just saying well that was an interesting choice but that's not the walk i want this is the walk i want and then you use your aids bring him up to that walk relax and then he's going to keep you're going to keep playing this ping pong game of you're going to get him to that walk he's going to fall back down you're going to get him to that walk he's going to fall back down you're going to get him to that walk and in the horse's mind what will start happening is he'll go man every time i slow down she applies more pressure again, maybe this time I'll just hold the walk for a bit. And you'll feel it. There'll be a moment where as soon as you relax your aids, they hold the walk for a couple of strides. 
and, and when I see that little light bulb go off in their head, like maybe it's better if I just can maintain an energetic walk. Here's what I do at that point. I will actually bring the horse to a stop and say, that's exactly what I wanted. You're on the right track. You held it all on your own without me babysitting you for a moment or two. And it seems so teeny, like, oh, that's not going to get me anywhere. But in the horse's mind, he's going to go, oh, so I tried a little bit harder than what she was asking, and I got a nice break. If you're clicker training, this is a beautiful spot to click and treat or simply, you know, just relax, let the horse, you know, bring the horse to a stop, pet on him, scratch on him, give him a moment to (sighs) stop and think, and then do it again. And this can basically be applied to whether you're working at a walk or a trot or a jog, or a lope, or a canter. So, exactly. And, let me th- oh, and when, if you're a dressage rider, or an English rider, where your calf is continuously in contact with the horse, you might be thinking to yourself, well, I can't do that. I can't take my legs off a horse. That's not what we do. But you can, because there's a difference between a supporting aid and a driving or pushing aid. So, exactly. like you alluded to, riders who constantly have their heels dug in or their spur touching... A lot, I would say the vast majority of us who do dressage are continuously driving our horses without realizing it and thus creating the scenario we just talked about. So you asked for that forward, more extended, I'm going to use my air quotes, extended walk, because in many cases it's it's just a more forward walk. It's not a genuine extension. It's okay. It's not the point of the conversation. Um, but when the horse achieves it, we don't realize that we have continued to use the driving aid well past when the horse has achieved the gait we're looking for. So you can still, again, I'm going to use my air quotes, take your aids off. You can still stop those aids, even if you're doing dressage and you don't stop touching the horse. Yeah? Yeah, exactly. You've got to do something to let him know he's hit the sweet spot. Think of it like, I guess, a gas pedal. So if I'm pressing on the gas pedal with the same amount of pressure, eventually my foot's going to go all the way to the floor, and I'm going to go at the highest speed. So like if I put my leg on the horse with a certain amount of pressure, I believe he should go, you know, up, 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 in speed or in gait until I stop doing that. Yeah. Um, you might, I might have to talk a little bit louder. We lost you a little bit, Mary. Okay. There you are. You're back. Okay. But if I take my foot completely off the gas pedal, no my good. car just flows all the way down. Can you hear me okay? Yep, we're good. Um, so you've got to have, yeah, in, in disciplines like dressage and even in the reining, we use a lot of leg as well. And this is where things get kind of subtle and you've got to really develop a lot of feel is, you, when I say take the leg off or relax your aids, that doesn't mean take your legs completely off their sides. Because, like, in, in the raining, if, you, if I do that, that means slide your butt into the ground right now. Stop. <laughs> um, so you can still keep leg on, but it should not. When, when you start to feel like it's taking more and more effort to get less and less from your horse, then what that's telling me is, okay, he's becoming desensitized to my cues. I need to liven it up again to where he, it doesn't take so much to, you know, to, uh, to get that horse to maintain a, a low-energy gait. So, yeah, so when I say relax your aids, it doesn't mean you have to completely stop everything, take your legs off his side, don't touch him with your legs. It just means quit asking with that same intensity. Give your horse a signal that he's, he's where you want him. Yeah. And the same goes for contact with the reins. You can have contact your entire ride and not be pulling on his mouth. If you feel like you're pulling his lips back to his eyeballs, then something's wrong. He's not listening. He's just taking the bit and going. Um, So when I get the horse in the frame I want with my hands, you don't have to completely relinquish contact, but you're going to soften your hands, give to him a little bit, and let him know that's where I want you right there. Because the horse doesn't, you know, we can't tell him, I want you to do extended walk at A. He's got to learn from what he feels coming from our aids. He's got to tell him, this is where I want you. There we go. Perfect. Well, we're going to take a break here and listen to uh, some words from our title sponsor, Horseware. It's fly season, people. (laughs) 
another long, tough fly season is right around the corner. And the only choice for this fly season are the Amigo range of fly sheets because they're built tough and feature the latest in design comfort, bug busting technology and sun protecting fabrics. And the Amigo range has a fly sheet for every budget. From the Amigo Bug Buster Vamoose with no fly zone to the Amigo Bug Rug Fly Sheet. Find Amigo Fly Sheets at your local or online retailer or you can visit horseware.com. That's horseware, H-O-R-S-E-W-A-R-E.com. There it is, fly season. It's going to stay here for quite some time, so head on over to horseware.com and check out the full line of Amigo and Rambo fly rugs. So what's going to be our list first listener question now that we've gabbed on and on about my question? Okay, let's see if I have enough internet to find it. Um, so all of these are kind of related to what we've been talking about. funny how about. that happened? <laughs> I know. This one's from Corinna, and she, uh, she says, A while ago you talked about training your horse to go to the mounting block. My Mustang loves the mounting block. Now how do I get him to leave it and walk off for a ride? He's resistant about going forward, so I could use some help with that too. Thanks. So this is the double-edged sword of the mounting block is we often start to train the behavior um, sometimes because we want a more convenient way to get on our horse or to save their back, but a lot of times it's because they won't stand still at the mounting block and we're having a heck of a time with it, so we've got to train it and make it a nice behavior. And once the horse learns that, oh, the mounting block's a great place to be, you're going to get rewards and release of pressure, and it's just a really nice place, then the problem is they won't leave the mounting block. They want to stay there. And I've started a number of colts uh, where I got them on them bareback from the mounting block, and because I spent so much time saying, oh, you want to be by the mounting block, it's so great. So when it's time for them to take their first steps at the rider, they're like, I don't want to leave the safety of my mounting block. So there are a couple of ways to do this. Um, one of the ways, so I'm going to give you the clicker training approach for those interested because uh, it does work pretty well. Um, so I had a few horses that this was the exact problem. Uh, I could get them to line up to the mounting block perfectly, and then I couldn't get them to leave. And the bigger challenge was they had never taken steps with a rider before. So, you know, I'm not just going to, like, whip them on the butt and hope for the best. Uh, Because as soon as they leave that mounting block, they might get really scared because now they're having to deal with this new thing and someone's on their back. And so I wanted to be like really kind of gentle about it and keep this whole vibe going of this is fun, you love this, you're getting rewards. So what I actually did using clicker training with these horses was I taught them to target something. So uh, with one horse, I had this giant road cone, and then I stuck my target, which is pretty much a stick with a ball at the end of it, uh, coming out of the cone. So it was this visible thing he could go over and touch. And I taught this, him how to do this through groundwork. So I you know, lead him to it when he touched it with his nose, click treat, and did that several times until where he would willingly like, go by himself and touch it. So then when I I go back to my mounting block and I'm going to try to get our first steps away from the mounting block, um, I put the target somewhere near the mounting block to where he'd only have to take a step or two to reach out and touch it. So I'd get on him from the mounting block, and then I'd use a little bit of leg and kind of point his nose at the target, and he'd go, oh, there's that thing I like, and he'd walk forward and touch it. So I clicked him for touching the target, but in the process, I got my forward steps. And then I would just move the target a little further away, a little further away to where he's walking 10, 20 steps. And in one horse's case, I actually made several of these targets and put them all over the arena. Oh, wow. Yeah, (laughs) it was really fun. So when he touched one target, he'd go, oh, there's another one over there. And he'd walk over to that one. And then when he got to that one, he'd say, oh, there's one over to the left there. And And so I got this horse walking all over the arena with tiny, tiny aids from me, I wasn't even, the cues weren't actually the things making him go. It was just seeing the target. But I used the opportunity, like, as he would step off to go to the next target, I'd use a little leg. Like, this is what it feels like when you're going forward. I'm going to use leg, and then you're going to go to this target. And then I'm going to use leg, and then you're going to go to this target. So then pretty soon I could actually wean the targets off and use leg 
and he'd go, oh, yeah, I remember that, and he'd walk forward, click tree. So that's the click, that's the clickerly way that click, I've done it. Clickerly? Um, <laughs> clickerly, yeah. Um, so if you're not doing the clicker training route, um, I would say you could get uh, the same thing to happen if he has difficulty moving away from the mounting block, just ask, ask, ask until he takes one step anywhere, even if it's to the side, and then release, say, hey, that's what I wanted, and then ask for another step. Ask, ask, ask. Be gentle, but, you know, use enough of your aids that he's going to try to do something. If he's just sitting there ignoring, then you need to increase pressure. But then as soon as he takes one little step, say, hey, that's what I wanted. And then you can actually expand this game. There's a couple of clinicians who use this exercise uh, called post-to-post. -post. And this is how I get horses to move out and stretch their legs out, um, is I'll pick a point on the fence and just ride my horse right to it, just point his nose at it. And then as soon as he gets there, I let him rest for a moment or two. Say, hey, now that we made it to our destination, you're going to rest. And then I'll turn around and find another point somewhere on the opposite fence and say, okay, now ride to that point. And I'll ride him all the way to it, and as soon as he makes it there, ah, stop, let him rest. And I'll do that all over the arena. And pretty soon at first your horse might have difficulty going forward or you'll have to really steer them and they're, they're going all over the place like a bumblebee. But when they realize that once they make it to that point on the fence, you let them rest for a moment, they go, oh, I want to get there sooner. Yes. Because I want to get to my rest. So they're, all they're sudden, motivated, yeah. Yeah. The cool thing with this exercise is uh, where in the beginning steps of it, you're really having to steer that horse, and he's looping all over the place before he gets to the point. All of a sudden, the lines get really straight, and you no longer have to steer him to go to the point. And then it gets even better. All of a sudden, you're like, I just think about a point, and my horse is, like, reading my mind. Um and that's where you get uh, some really nice forward movement. And it all results out of you pick a clear point that you want your horse to go to, keep him on task, and then when he does it, ah, rest. Don't underestimate, even in your hot horses, the power of letting them just rest for a moment. You're not going to bother them for a few moments. Just sit here. Yeah. Um, for our reigning horses, this is very similar to an exercise we call fencing. And a lot of people see people fence, and some reiners are kind of aggressive about it, and they think that these reiners, it's where the horse runs from one end of the arena to the other. And they think they're actually purposely trying to smash their horse into the fence. Yeah, it, um, it, yeah, it can be pretty frightening to watch. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't like to go that crazy, hardcore. But what the exercise is accomplishing is actually working on the horse's stop, believe it or not. Because in the pattern, in the reigning pattern, that's where we're going to do our stop. We go around one at the short end of the arena and then come down the, you know, close to the center line, um, and the horse runs, 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 and then stops somewhere toward the other end of the arena. So if the horse cannot travel forward or, and straight, the stop is going to be terrible. Uh, it's just not going to work. He's not going to be able to put both feet, both hind legs into the ground equally to get the balance he needs to slide. So instead of making our horse stop over and over and over again and just having the answer be wrong every time, we work on that straight line. And when we start this process, we start them, uh, you know, early in their training, and I just start at a trot. I just go down, you know, down that center line, go from point to point, and then let him rest at the end. And then what ends up happening is when you turn that corner to go down that center line, you are not steering their horse. They know where they're supposed to go because they've gotten rewarded every time they made it to the other side of that fence. And once you have that beautiful straight line, the stop is going to be really, really good. There we go. And um, this can be applied if you are someone who doesn't work in an arena very much. This can be applied to any open area where you ride and it's even applicable to hacking about and uh, regular listeners will have probably have heard this before. Whenever we ride around our neighborhood, which is where we ride for the most part, we're on roads or on the shoulders of roads. And we made it our habit from day one that each time we get to a stop sign, we stop. And this is a good idea when you drive a carriage horse for obvious reasons, Ooh, but yeah. my riding horse does it too. And we discovered 
that after a short period of time, as soon as the horses would make a turn where they would see the next stop sign, you could feel a change in the way they moved. They, you could tell that they were going for a location versus just walking along for a ride in the country. And they kind of have that at least mental wandering feel to them. They see a stop sign. They go, oh, I need to go there. Because <laughs> they know we would have a stop and frequently get a cookie. Exactly. And it it does make a difference. So you're a dressage rider. You can still do the same thing if you... And that's a, a double plus for this type of exercise in that. Yeah. Dressage it will also have help letters, the, so it's really easy. To yeah, it'll help the letters. rider develop better eyes because, I'm sorry, if you look at pictures of people doing dressage, most of us are looking at the horse's ears. Yes. Yes. And this, and if you're looking at your horse's ears, this is not going to work. So it, it's a good way for the, both the horse and the rider to develop a better eye. And in the long term, you're going to find that you don't have to. I'm going to use my air quotes today. I'm using them a lot today. You're not going to have to nag the horse so much to stay straight because your intent is going to be much more clear to your horse. And this applies to the jumpers as well, um, oh. and I'm sure most of them know this. You don't, you're not looking at the cross rail you're riding towards. All your energy is going to go down, and your horse is more likely to go, oh, I'm not going to take this jump. Um, you want to look through those jump standards, and you know, to some point on a straight line way off in the distance, whether it's the other side of the arena or that tree in the pasture over there, um, and the jump is just, an obstacle on that line you're riding. So for horses that uh, want to refuse jumps or horses that jump and then they want to crow hop and, and canter, what I'd do is take that jump down, put, put, it, you know, put it as a ground pole, and think about instead of going to that jump, ride between those standards to some point on the other side of the arena, and you'll be really surprised at how they straighten up and they're Speed starts to regulate much better. Um, mm-hmm. They start to, to use their energy in better ways, and you stop getting that trot, 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 jump, canter, canter, kick out, run off <laughs> uh, <laughs> pattern. All the things we don't want. There we go. Yeah. And speaking of using your energy in positive ways, Justin over at Total Saddle Fit uses his energy to create amazing products that help our horses do their job better. And one of those items is their Perfect Saddle Pad, which is a Western saddle pad that they've made. And it's backed by popular demand. And after years of refinement, it's out and it's ready for you. It's a 100% wool saddle pad with a plethora of performance and comfort features that you're not going to find anywhere else. It is fully vented with an open spine channel. It's 25 millimeters thick, just right. And it's 100% wool. It's got a cutaway at the base of the pad for a slimmer feeling for your rider's legs. You can have it on when you need it. And it comes complete with a set of six millimeter felt shims. And that's a total of six shims altogether. And it is backed by Total Saddle Fit's 30 day, 100% money back promise. No risk. And it comes for si- in three different sizes, something to fit your saddle. So go to totalsaddlefit.com and check out the perfect saddle pad. And you're going to guarantee going to be guaranteed to love it the money back and this month may of 2020 they have a 90 day return on all orders this month returns accepted used and abused so actually try it make sure you love it that's how much confidence they have in the total saddle fit perfect saddle pad at www.totalsaddlefit.com and my voice is tired so we're going to take a quick break here listen to a song and we're going to come back and listen and uh, answer Another listener question. I'm feeling all cooped up, feeling all caged in, need to get a little air. I can breathe again Got a thirst in my heart Hunger in my eyes Need to satisfy my soul 
free my wild side My wheels have been spinning like crazy in my head Gotta get back to living before I forget My sights are set where well, that green grass is A good running star She get me Fresh pair of wings and a long stretch of sky. I've sat up these dreams, I'm holding on tight. Need a good, strong, tall wind and a horse that can fly. Yeah. Got a load on my back and a lot on my mind. Yeah, the weight of this world really gets me sometimes There's a freedom inside me I've been missing so much Gonna kick the gates wide open And live a big old cloud of dust Yeah, 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 yeah Cause I need somewhere to run Somewhere to rock A fresh pair of wings And a long stretch of sky Set of these dreams, I'm holding them tight. Need a good, strong, tall wind and a horse that can fly. Yeah. Giddy up, look at what lies on the Second star to the left, then straight on till morning. Cause I need somewhere to run, somewhere to run. A fresh pair of wings and a long stretch of sky. Set up these dreams, holding on tight. Need a good, strong, tall wind And a horse that can fly Yeah I need a horse that can fly Feeling all cooped up Feeling all caged in Templeton Thompson, a horse that can fly. You can find her music at our website, templetonthompson.com, and you can also download it on your favorite streaming service. Okay, Mary, what's our next listener submitted question? Okay, this one's from Tanya, and she says she has a quite quick but intelligent young mare. Uh, she's in the process of starting her. However, she gets very angry at the saddle, kicks and bites at her shoulders and sides. She now has had a break to be inseminated, so bred, and um, she's very tight when she touched her on the left side in the saddle area. Yesterday I massaged her in the area for 20 minutes and then did a mounting block exercise. How do I proceed with the saddle? Could it be an idea to get her to choose the saddle just as she does in this clip? And she posted a video. I cannot watch the video because I don't have internet, but... Um, I would say, based off of what you've told me, that you might consider um, checking that it's not a physical issue, checking your saddle fit. Um, in uh, several cases I've had where the horse is reaching around and biting at their girth area or trying to bite the saddle, um, it could be digestive upset, such as ulcers. Um, 
and you can treat them for that. That's what my gut is telling me. Um, that you, usually, if they if they bite and bite at their sides and kick, it's it's not often um, them being naughty or or even fearful. Uh, it's that oh, this hurts. This makes me feel very Discomfort. uncomfortable. Yeah. I want you to get off from me yeah. right now. Yeah. And um, yeah, I would I would probably you know just maybe have a checkup with the vet uh, or maybe have some body work done. Yeah, check up with the vet. Make sure. Have have a disinterested third party check your saddle and girth fit. Yeah. Yeah. Saddle fit. Yeah. Shoulder relief girth. Just saying. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. That just came to my yeah, mind just perfect. a second. So that was that's very interesting because I think that is a pretty a pretty common behavior pattern. And I know growing up, I'm going to date myself, that was just considered the horse being naughty. Mm-hmm. nobody ever thought for a second that there might be some discomfort there because back in the day we had no idea horses got ulcers. Um, so it was just a case of, you know, give them a slug. They'll be fine. Yeah. And, you know, uh, there a lot of um, horse living situations can really contribute uh, to digestive upset. You know, a horse that's being stalled. Uh, certain kinds of diets can help, uh, can exacerbate problems. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, and, and I had one case especially. I had this mare in for training. She was just in for tune up. She, you know, she'd been started. She'd been well trained. Uh, she'd done this and that and the other. And then she'd had about two years off and she just needed to come back and get tuned up. Well, I put the saddle on her and she exploded bucking. Oh, no. And I thought, well, you're just, just a little fresh. Haven't been worked in a while. And, and, but then she wouldn't stop, um, and I tried all sorts of training techniques to help get her over it, uh, and it just it just was not stopping. And, and it also had some weird other issues that I thought were unrelated crop up. She was extremely ear shy, and I knew that the way she was trained and her owner had never done anything abusive to her ears or anything like that. I, there was no trauma I could I, that I knew of. Um, so I actually hauled her to the vet to have her ears cleaned out because sometimes, you know, in Texas they could have an ear full of ticks and it's really painful. And her ears were fine, you know, nothing nothing real remarkable about it. And I had to be very careful about how I put the halter on her because if I got anywhere near her ears, she'd duck and run backwards. And so she had all these just kind of weird issues. And uh, I actually started her, and I had even done a round of ulcer guard and, didn't really see much of a difference there, so I thought, well, it's probably not ulcers. Um, and I started her on a supplement um, called, uh, oh gosh, Redmond Daily Gold Stress Relief, which uh, it doesn't really like treat. It's not labeled to treat ulcers, but I I believe how it works is it puts kind of a buffer in their tummy and helps kind of tap that stomach acid down and relax any kind of discomfort that they're feeling. And, you know, someone had given me a free tub of it. So I was like, well, let's try this. And, you know, started her on it. And then um, on day four, I went in her stall to catch her. And I absentmindedly just threw a halter on her head. And I stopped and I go, oh, wait a minute. You didn't run backwards trying to kill yourself because, you know, you're, you're, not, ear, you're not acting ear shy. And I was like, well, that's interesting. And uh, so I was like, well, huh, you know. That's, that's interesting. You're not doing that anymore. And by the end of the week, she actually completely stopped bucking with the saddle. Um, she went on to ride beautifully, and, and you know, we were able to, to solve that issue. And it was just one of those things. The thing that really made me stop and go, okay, training, this is not a training issue. You've got discomfort was I had tried everything to get to overcome her her extreme aversion to the saddle. I saddled her several times a day. I'd tie her and let her wear the saddle for a while. I did. I tried clicker training, and it's, at one point, I'm like, you know, I'm just going to climb all over you bareback. We'll start there. We'll just take the saddle out of the equation. And when I went to start to leg up on her bareback, as soon as I just laid my hands on her side, I saw her just wince, hmm. and I thought, okay, that's not. That's not you being silly. Um, you you don't want me to touch you. Like you're you're yeah. so uncomfortable. You don't even like me laying my hands on you. So that made me go, huh? Okay, 
we need to figure out what this is. And sometimes it's this very difficult process to try to pinpoint it, but yeah. I've done this enough over the years that usually I can kind of start to read the signs. The the penny ears looking back at their belly, um, that you know, it could be any number of things. They might be out somewhere. They might have soreness due to the saddle. It could be ulcers. But what I do feel in, in these cases, more often than not, is it is a physical discomfort yeah. issue. And, and that should yeah, be... Yeah, the hard part is just systematically narrowing it down, okay? Yeah. We have... Yeah, you do it one at a time because what we want to do is throw everything at it, hoping something works to get it taken care of sooner because that takes less time. You throw everything at it at one time, but then you don't know what the problem was. Which one of those 10 things you threw at it at one time yeah. really fixed the issue? I know with Nigel, my OTTB, he was built a little bit like an old pickup truck, big, round, beefy looking guy. He is very prone to muscle soreness. Um, he has poor posture. It goes on and on. So if I am not um, actively keeping after that, I get, you know, do, doing muscle massage and things like that, he will start to bite at the girth because his muscles get sore. And whenever the girth is tightened, it puts pressure on some of the muscles behind his shoulder blades that get sore. Um, and it's related to his conformation. He's not built really great, so he's very prone to that sort of thing. Um, so paying attention to that kind of thing. And, and it's amazing because we assume we, and one of the jokes that us horse folks always have is it's just not fair because we have not ridden for a while. We are unfit. We take our horse out and he just goes and goes and goes. And the next day he looks fine and we hurt all over. Right. Yeah. We forget a horse is genetically designed to not tell us that he hurts. Exactly. <laughs> so what, why, what we may perceive as a horse who looks fine when, in fact, he's got a lot of little chunks of muscle soreness that unless we go searching very carefully and pay very close attention, he won't, we won't know it. And maybe, and this is just maybe, a horse that is biting at his girth actually has some muscle soreness in one particular muscle that, yep. like, you know, you pull the girth up and that girth buckle puts a tiny little bit of pressure on that one sore muscle, so he's going to bite the wall. Who knows? So, yeah, I think a, a little investigative, a little Sherlock Holmes might uh, go a long way on this one. Yeah. Did I ever tell, did I ever tell the story about the, the mare that um, was at this clicker training clinic that I was a participant in, and she had very much the same behavior. Like, you couldn't brush her behind her withers, and she'd reach back and bite, try and bite. E. No, yeah, tell me. so I do want to add this because I think it's it's very relatable and how things can somehow totally not be what you were thinking it could be when it comes to pain and discomfort. And uh, so it was at this clicker training clinic, um, and this mare was a really educated mare. She could do all these really cool things with the clicker, and she was doing in-hand dressage. Just, uh, she was a nice mare. Um, but the owner was having trouble with the saddle, horses reaching back, bite, 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 that kind of same behavior. And it was getting to where if she, when she was grooming her, if she even brushed her behind the withers, the mare's reaching back, pinning her ears, threatening to bite. So what I thought was like, oh, probably ulcers. Um, so the clinician um, had her little bag of treats in her clicker, and she started doing approach and retreat with the mare. So she'd start where the mare would allow her. You know, she, the mare was like, you can touch me on the neck. I won't kill you there. And would reward the horse, oh, you let me touch you there. And then she'd move back inch by inch um, and then keep rewarding the horse as the horse led her further back. And by doing this process of this approach and retreat and rewarding the horse for letting her guard down every little bit of the way, all of a sudden the mare was like, well, you can touch me on the shoulders. That's fine. Okay, yes, you can touch me you know, on, on my side, I'm okay with that. And this huge circle of de self-defense this horse had of this boundary where she was like, don't touch me there, it started getting smaller and smaller and smaller to where the horse was like, yeah, I'll allow you to touch me down my rib cage. Yep, yep, you can run your hand on my flank. And at this point, the clinician um, took a look at the mare, her udders, and asked the owner, she's like, have you ever cleaned her udders? We always think about cleaning geldings. We don't think about mares. And the, the owner was like, well, no. 
And so she looked under there, kind of started investigating. And she, goes, she goes, she's really irritated down there. She had a lot of fly bites, a lot of dirt. And she was slowly able to start kind of cleaning that area out. And that mare goes, oh, thank God. That is what was driving me nuts. Thank you. You found it. And so it was this very small area on the horse where they were feeling discomfort. But over time, she was just getting more grumpy and more, you know, irritated to where you couldn't even go past her shoulder. And she was like, don't touch me. So, you know, initially you might think, oh, her shoulder might hurt or maybe her back or maybe she has ulcers. And it was something completely different. And it just took you know, this kind of like investigative, let's let's see where it's really coming from. And we were lucky to find it, you know, that quickly. Uh, sometimes, like I said, it takes vets and x-rays and sonograms. and yeah. But it is important <laughs> to try to root it out if you can. Yeah, yeah. Well, you put on your deer stalker hat and go to town, right? Yep. All right. What's our next listener question? Okay. Let me see. Oh, we got time for one more. Okay. Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, okay, TJ Eggs, she goes, is there a way to teach collection in hand? <gasps> yeah, this is one of my favorite subjects, too, and I'm, I'm still a novice at it, so that's my little caveat there. And Allison Marie actually replied and said not to hijack anything, but yes, there is. I'd recommend looking into straightness training with, and I know who this trainer is, but I will butcher the name. I think her name is Marie Dejong. Um, I think she's from the Netherlands if I'm not mistaken, because they have a lot of free content. It's all about collection and a lot of in-hand work. And I wanted to put that comment on there because, yes, that is a really nice program um, that I've looked into myself. I think it's it's a really kind of comprehensive. It just sort of follows the whole classical in-hand type of groundwork. Um, So I do something similar, kind of this in-hand approach, and I actually use clicker training to teach collection in-hand. And where I first became interested in this is when I first started clicker training, I knew like a couple things you could teach your horse, like, oh, you could teach him to target and this and that and the other. And then I saw a video of this gal working with um, this horse, and the horse was completely at liberty, so had no equipment on it, and he was cantering around her in perfect collection at liberty. And my jaw just hit the floor. I was like, oh, my gosh, I want that. How do I get that? What is that? And I actually contacted her and said, okay, how how do you do that? And she said, well, you know, I teach them systematically with the positive reinforcement, um, how to travel in this way. And over time, they just like to do it, so they continue doing it. And (laughs) when I first heard that, I was like, okay, but really, how do you teach that? Because I've come from a world, and it's very similar for many of us, where you're constantly trying to put your horse in frame and keep him in frame, and we've got all these systems and sidelines and special bits and everything to try to make that horse look pretty and in frame. And I'm not knocking any tools or any pieces of tack, but that was just my my experience up to that point of we're constantly – facing this challenge of trying to make that horse go in frame. And here's someone who has nothing on their horse, and the horse is like, I think I shall travel collected today, and it's beautiful. And so I learned um, through a little trial and error myself, just experimenting with my horses and using methods um, that I picked up uh, learning in hand work. And I would say, yeah, look into the straightness training program. There are other really great in hand methods out there. Um, there's ways to do it with clicker training, but yes, to answer the question, it is possible, totally worth working on. Um, and, uh, some of the exercises that I teach on the ground to start getting this to happen, um, it's important first that they can move forward, they can walk alongside you, uh, you can get them to move out and around you, um, you know, at least at a walk, if that's where I'd start, you know, get a nice, beautiful, energetic walk, get that forward going, um, make sure they're not particularly spooky, uh, and then you can start refining your groundwork. And so I will teach uh, a horse to shoulder in on the ground. Uh, so how I actually teach it is I teach them to do a shoulder in on a circle, and I have them go around, and I'll just 
gently encourage them to bring their nose to the inside of the circle. And I use clicker training, but you can use a release of pressure. And any time that horse starts to give me this kind of pleasing arc in their neck and they bring their nose to the inside, I'll click and treat. And then I just ask for a little bit more and a little bit more. And eventually I can direct their nose and their shoulder to the inside of the circle. So I've got that shoulder in happening on the circle. Once I get it on the circle, then I can get it on the straight line. So I can have the horse walk beside me down the rail with their shoulder coming to the inside track. Um, and from there, I can usually, I've got enough tools to teach um, an in-hand, I guess, leg yield, so to speak. I can lift my rein in a different way and ask the horse to move away while keeping a slight inside bend, and I can click and treat that. So that's where I start. It's very similar to what you would teach with dressage under saddle. Um, completely possible, really fun to work on, um, and uh, you can, like I said, look into the straightening pro uh straightness training or you can do like I did and you know read a few things here and there and then just go have fun with your horse and do a little bit of trial and error there you go trial and error there and experimentation it's it's a lot of fun when uh, you start doing that kind of stuff well we have yeah. plum run out of time for today so oh, no. for folks who are more curious about what Mary does as far as your training your clinics your artwork there's a lot going on in your life where can they appropriately stalk you you can find me on Facebook at Mary Kitts Miller Horsemanship, um, and I've got a lot of jewelry that I'm working on. That's that's I've been hogging my horsemanship page with posts about that. Um, but yep, any kind of updates I have will be on my Facebook page, Mary Kitts Miller Horsemanship. There we go. Find her there, and you will be back again next month on the second Thursday. So HRN auditors, watch for Mary's post when it's usually the night before a show. <laughs> When she has questions. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and we will be back again tomorrow. That's Friday with uh, more fun and hilarity on the Horses in the Morning show. And don't forget, we have a really bad ads tomorrow. Get your ads in to Jennifer at HorseRadioNetwork.com. Thank you once again for our title sponsor today, Horseware. We could not do this show without them, quite literally. Check them out at Horseware.com. They've got the full line of fly rugs for this time of year.